Welcome back to Myth and Human Culture. I promised you that today we were going to take a look at the trickster hero found in the story of the um, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. We're going to be doing Egyptian creation myths. Now, the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, which you should have read by now, is not straightforward the creation of the world. It's tied to a number of stories um, that are creation stories in ancient Egypt. And I know your textbook doesn't include Egyptian creation stories as far as the beginning of the world goes. It kind of goes right towards the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And the reason for that is probably because there were so many different creation stories out of ancient Egypt, it's hard to pick the one that you want to include in the textbook. Whereas the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus is a really great narrative. Um, and it's going to be very useful in, again, investigating the character of the trickster. This time the trickster being the famous character of Set, or Seth is sometimes referred to. So let's take a look at Osiris, Isis, and Horus. But I'm going to start by going back and dealing with some other of those creation stories that you did not read. So let's talk about Egypt first, where it falls in relation to this, uh, the cultures that we talked about last time. Uh, we started in ancient Mesopotamia at Babylon, and then we worked into the Levant and talked about ancient Israel briefly with the uh, stories in the Hebrew scriptures, um, the first book, the book of Genesis. Moving down further into North Africa, we finally get to Egypt. Okay, the star shows up in Lower Egypt, which is the north, at the city of Memphis, which was one of the great capitals of ancient Egypt. And the story that we're talking about goes way, way back in time. This is one of the oldest stories probably from ancient Egypt. Um, now, all these cultures, like I said last time, were uh, in contact with each other. You have uh, trade that runs all the way through um, from Egypt to Mesopotamia. We know the Egyptians understood um, the culture of Mesopotamia and vice versa. And there was probably a little bit of give and take as far as their stories go. But we'll point out very similarities and differences as we move forward. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background for ancient Egypt. A quick historical sketch. Um, Egyptian history is a very long stretch of time. It actually is going to cover a lot more time than I went through with early Babylon. Um, so I'm just going to give you the basic time periods if you're going to break Egyptian history into general time periods. And the, the, the dates are always being revised by archaeologists and Egyptologists. So um, you may come across different dates. They're going to be fairly close to the ones that I've got for you. But let's say 3300 to about 3150 would be kind of the pre-dynastic period. All right, you've got Egypt, which was not yet unified. You've got two different kingdoms at least, most likely Upper and Lower Egypt. And then around 3150 to 2686, you have what's called the earlier proto-dynastic period. Now, a dynasty, I probably should just point out in case you're not familiar with the name, would have to do with the ruling family. And it's at this point that Egypt is unified. Upper and Lower Egypt are brought together. The great Pharaoh Narmer uh, is the guy credited with unifying Egypt. And as far as mythology goes, the unification is kind of represented by a pairing of deities, um, Nekbet and Wadjet. Uh, Nekbet, the vulture, and Wadjet, the serpent or the scorpion. I'm not the scorpion, but the, um, I was going to say cobra. Um, are two, are two uh, figures that represent, they're goddesses, by the way, that represent Upper and Lower Egypt, respectively. You also have the lords of the two lands, um, Horus and Set, basically, as they emerge, um, again, showing this union of the two kingdoms. Uh, from 2686 to 2181, you've got the Old Kingdom. Now, this is the time of the pyramids, which I've got, you know, showing on the on the screen right there. But what goes along with the pyramids, and obviously not with all of the pyramids, are a group of texts that are known as the pyramid texts. They show up in the fifth dynasty uh, in the um, pyramid of the pharaoh Unas, or Weni. And these texts, uh, I forget how many they actually are, something like 800 different spells and incantations. They're funerary texts that have to do with the preparation of the, um, the dead the deceased for the afterlife. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about the Egyptian view of the afterlife, but I'll see if I can unpack that maybe closer to the end of the lecture. But there were a number of different funerary texts that were developed over the course of numerous kingdom periods, the pyramids, uh, pyramid texts being the oldest ones. 
Okay, they were written on the walls of the pyramids, which is why they're called pyramid texts. Um, but again, they're all magical. And then you get this intermediate period. There's going to be a number of any intermediate periods that break Egyptian history um, from these kingdom periods. Uh, usually a period of disunity, fragmentation, sometimes foreign invasion. But 2181 to about 2040 is the first one of these. 2040 to 1782, you have the Middle Kingdom, where you have reunification. Uh, the 11th and 12th dynasties come to prominence. And you're moving away from not only building pyramids, but using pyramid texts. Some of those uh, spells and magical incantations and um, texts were adapted and adopted and moved into what are known as the coffin text, which is a, uh, I believe it's a much larger collection of funerary literature. These would be written on the inside of the sarcophagi, the um, coffin text, on the inside of the, the coffin that went into the afterlife with the deceased. And I will point out something about the coffin because that coffin is a very important emblem in the story of Osiris, as we'll see shortly. Second intermediate period, 1782 to 1570, would have been a fragmentation period. You have foreign invaders that take over a good portion of Egypt, particularly the north, the lower portion, the delta. Uh, these are known as the Hyksos. Then, after they're driven out in 1570 or thereabouts, you have the beginning of the New Kingdom, which is going to go, in about, go until about 1070. Now, by this period, we've also moved away from the coffin text, and we now have the development of a new collection of literature. It's collectively known as the Book of the Dead. It's not really a particular book. It's a collection of all kinds of different scrolls, and, and different scrolls actually have different um, portions or different spells um, recorded on them. But the general title or the actual title for this collection of material is called The Spells of Going Forth by Day. Okay, you've probably seen illustrations from the Book of the Dead if you've seen you know, Egyptian artwork on papyrus. These were papyrus scrolls that were placed into the coffin, into the tomb with the deceased, so that you have you know, the spells handy uh, for your judgment. Right? These are basically like answers, you know, how you're supposed to respond to the gods who sit in judgment over you, the, the uh, answers to the questions that you might want to take on the ultimate test, your test for the afterlife. Of course, after the New Kingdom, which was a period of empire and prosperity for Egypt, you move into another intermediate period, about 1070 to 525, if these dates can be trusted. And again, these are always being challenged. Um, and then the late period, 525 to 332, I'm going to go a little bit further, and there's a reason for this. The Hellenistic period, which begins with Alexander the Great, 332 to about 30 BC, with the death of Cleopatra. This was the time when you have Greek rule. Um, the late period, by the way, was a period where you have Persian rule in Egypt. Uh, Hellenistic period, Greek rule, really under the Ptolemies. Alexander the Great's general Ptolemy took over uh, Egypt after Alexander's death in 323. And then in 30, after Cleopatra commits suicide, it was really the Roman Empire that uh, kind of absorbed Egypt as a province and it was no longer an independent kingdom. Now, the reason I'm going all the way to Rome is because the story that you guys should have read of Osiris, Isis, and Horus is not a story we get from the Egyptian texts. We have a lot of references to the god Osiris as you know, judge of the dead and lord of the underworld going all the way back to the pyramid text. So we know the myth of Osiris was incredibly old. There are vague references to portions of the story in these texts, but the full story that we're about to discuss shows up in a Greek writer by the name of Plutarch, who was writing in the first century AD in the early Roman period, okay, or the early centuries of the Roman Empire. And he apparently learned the story from the Egyptian priests in Egypt, um, if he's to be trusted. So that's where we're going to get the story from. Now, let's go back and talk a little bit about some of these creation myths that kind of set the stage for the generation of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Um, but these would be some of the gods that come along a little bit earlier. Now, there are multiple creation stories, and they are all kind of unique and different and would be regional. Remember, Egypt wasn't unified until about 3150 B.C. Prior to that, well, even after that, it really doesn't matter whether they're unified or not. There were different local stories in circulation. You know, this particular city may have their particular story. And it's always going to be something to be aware of when you study mythology, that there are contradictory stories. There are multiple versions of stories. And if you think these things need to fit together, then you don't, you're wrong. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, part of the interest of the story of studying this stuff is to look at the variations within a story. It gives you a little bit of an insight into different 
time periods, different locations. Um, but the same thing was in ancient Egypt. These contradictions uh, are bound to arise. And actually, I think when you look at the text of Plutarch, as he's writing the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, he does seem to be aware of some contradictory stuff going on in Egypt, and he actually tries to harmonize, I think, some of those traditions within his text. But uh, maybe I'll point those out later as we get into the stuff. But the Memphite creation would be a very early creation associated with the region of Memphis. Um, the city of Memphis itself being one of the early capitals of Egypt. It was originally called um, the House of the Soul of Ta. Because as a matter of fact, the word Egypt itself um, is where we is is the sort of the transliteration of the Latin from the Greek from the ancient Egyptian uh, that referred to that the house of the soul of Ta. So the PT at the end of the word Egypt comes from the god Ta. So that's what Memphis was used to, used to be known as. Now in this creation story, you've got the god Ta who creates. He's kind of a craftsman god in a certain sense, but he creates through thought and speech. I just want to point out a few little pieces of some of these stories so that you can see the differences, but also I want you to, but again, think of the similarities to some of the stuff we already talked about. When we saw the Hebrew text, we saw, you know, the idea of names and naming in the Enuma Elish. Here you've got a God who thinks in his heart and speaks with his tongue and things come forth as he creates the world out of chaos, right? It starts again with chaos that should be pointed out that almost every single Egyptian creation story starts with what's called the Nun, the waters of chaos, this watery um, primeval state or primordial state. Okay, So here you get this idea of creation by speech. And by the way, it was the heart that the ancient Egyptians and other cultures, ancient even in the Near East, believed was the seat of our intellect. This is what we thought with. We thought with the heart and then we spoke through the mouth. So you've got that creation story. At Heliopolis, you've got the Heliopolitan creation story, which is attached to the god Atum or Ra. Atum and Ra sometimes, you know, merge together. They're sometimes distinct, but um, Ra is the sun god. And the creation involves a group of gods known as the Ennead, which means the nine gods. Ra is the first of them, Shu and Tefnut, and then Nut and Geb. And then the fourth generation, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. That's where we're obviously going to get to the story today. They're part of the Ennead. So in the story, Ra is going to have a big role to play, as well as Nut and Geb, in giving rise to this next generation of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Okay, so that's the story. Uh, and then this creation, it's, it's very, I guess you could say, maybe a little bit more primitive than the Memphite creation, in that the creation, again, starts with Nun, but then you have this idea of self-creation, right? To get the God brings himself into being. And then as it goes through the creation, you have kind of a sexual reproduction where you have just Atom Ra and I guess I could just use the term. It's kind of a masturbation um, to produce, to, to bring forth seed because the text actually says he pours his own seed into his mouth and then he starts to produce life. So it's kind of, I guess you would call it an asexual reproduction. Um, but again, it has very much this sexual um, aspect to it, clearly. Okay, so very different than the just merely speaking into existence. If you go to the city of Hermopolis, you get the Hermopolitan creation. That's a tongue twister. And in this story, you've got a different group of gods known as the Ogdoad, or the, the group of eight um, usually represented as frogs and snakes, male and female respectively. And they're pairings of male and female deities. And here you've got, again, this idea of nun, which are the primor primordial waters, the primeval waters, but paired with a feminine nanet. And um, then you've got kek and keket, the primeval darkness, het and hechet, the strong currents, possibly the flood or infinity. It's Hard to actually interpret what those words mean. I've seen different suggestions. I don't know Egyptian, so I couldn't uh, hazard a guess on my own. And then Amun and Amunet, which represent invisible power. And it's Amun that really is one of the most important gods in Egyptian history. Now, interestingly, I want to call your attention back to the Hebrew account in the beginning. And this is why I said, when you look at the Hebrew writer of Genesis, it's clear that he understood what was going on in the Babylonian account, but he also understands some of the Egyptian um, perspective, because when he starts to talk about um, 
forget how it was phrased originally in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it talks about, you know, the spirit of God, uh, you know, it was darkness upon the waters and the spirit of God hovered over the waters, right? Here you clearly have kind of a collection of these same ideas, the primeval water of chaos, darkness upon the water, and then kind of this invisible power, the spirit of God hovering above the deep. Okay, so here in really, again, a single line, you've got um, an answer to the Ogdawad, and it is probably written as a direct counter to the Egyptian idea of these gods coming together and creating um, the world there. Okay, so the Hebrew response to the Egyptian story. There's also a Theban creation that focuses on Amun specifically. Amun actually rose to be essentially a supreme being among Egyptian gods. He was going to be viewed as the father of the pharaohs, um, the invisible one, who's kind of beyond the other gods. Very powerful priesthood down at Karnak, where his temple was. But um, in, in the creation of Amun, he come, kind of comes forth uh, with like the call of a goose, and he breaks the silence over the primeval waters and brings forth the great mound of creation. And uh, it's a little bit closer, the idea of at least the sound that brings forth um, life, um, similar to the, the creation of Ta, but also different at the same time. And then we've got the creation of Knum, who is, again, a, a potter god, a, uh, uh, craftsman god. And in this creation story, uh, you have Knum making man, uh, fashioning them out of clay, kind of uh, the way a potter would fashion a pot. So at least five different stories, all of them a very unique creation account. Um, worth noting and, and paying attention to, uh, the variety is very interesting. But now let's go back and talk, well, I guess about Ra. Um, and the serpent, since we've talked already about the serpent motif with Tiamat fighting Marduk. Uh, again, we have that same type of motif in Egyptian mythology, basically with the god Ra in his solar barge as he goes through the underworld every day to begin his, you know, he goes you know, through the sky at night uh, as the sun and then through the underworld, the duat, the darkness, and fights off the great serpent of chaos known as Apep. And here's actually a, a, a kind of a blurry picture from a papyrus of the god Ra seated in his barge. And in front of him is the god Set, who is actually his assistant in this scene, fighting the serpent who you see kind of coiled all the way below the barge. So again, kind of the dragon versus hero motif. Um, and this is a recurring thing. He continually has to fight the serpent every night over and over and over again so that the sun can bring forth order the next day. You've got to struggle against the darkness and the chaos, which always seeks to destroy order um, eternally. Okay, so that's kind of this running theme in Egyptian uh, mythology. Now, let's get to the big story, the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. I already said it comes from Plutarch. Uh, his work was called On Isis and Osiris. Um, in the background of this slide, before I bring up any more text, you can see... Um, on the left side, the god Thoth, who's going to be very important in the story. But on the right, you've got a picture of the goddess Nut, um, who is the goddess of the skies. And lying on the ground below is the god Geb, her brother, who is the god of the earth. Um, it's kind of interesting that the sky deity is a goddess, and the male deity it represents the earth. It's not that you don't see earth gods in various cultures, but um, very often, especially in the European mythological traditions, they're reversed. You have a sky father and an earth mother. The Egyptians had it reversed, and that's fine. But between them, you've got the god Shu, who's holding up his daughter away from his son. Uh, if you remember the generations I gave you in the um, Ennead earlier, um, the idea of there needs to be something that prevents the heavens and the earth or keeps them from collapsing one upon the other um, and also prevents you know the two children from um, coupling and, and, and it's kind of a sexual union between heaven and earth it's something that we can refer to as the hieros gamos this holy marriage that we'll see in other texts and traditions okay and again it's a symbol of life that the marriage of heaven and earth brings forth life and fertility and all that kind of stuff just the way the you know the, the skies rain on the earth and the earth brings forth its fruit so that's um, a few of the characters that are going to be really important in the story, particularly Nut. So we're going to talk about her fertility. And here are the principal characters that we're going to look at in the text. Ra, and again, different versions of this story are going to be um, 
out there, but we're going to follow the one that's actually in your textbooks, which is going to have Ra married off to Nut. Very often you have Ra and Geb as a couple. And I think I left Geb off of the slide, so I apologize for that. But you got Ra, Nut, you got Thoth, you've got Osiris, Set, Isis, and Horus. Now, your text will give you other names, um, which maybe I'll point out a little bit later, but these are the key ones. So let's talk about the basic story. Let me actually go back to the beginning with Ra. So the story talks about Ra being married to Nut. Now, the problem in the story from the beginning is Nut is not a faithful wife, and she's having affairs with a number of other gentlemen, Geb, her brother, being one, and the god Thoth being the other. And as always happens in mythology, the goddess conceives. And she's going to conceive multiple children because she's sleeping with multiple people. And in the story, she actually has children that she conceives with Ra, with Geb, with Thoth, all together. She has five children that she conceives. And Ra finds out of her unfaithfulness and then curses her and prevents her from giving birth, which is a pretty bad curse when you're pregnant with... Um, pentuplets or whatever they're called when you've got five of them. Anyways, the five children cannot be born on any day of any month of the year. Now, whenever they issue a curse or a prophecy in mythology, there's usually some kind of loophole or some way around it. Now, what happens is it seems pretty airtight and Nut is definitely in agony, but the god Thoth, who happens to be a god of wisdom and magic, figures out a way to manipulate the situation and win forth enough light to produce some new days. He actually goes and gambles with the, the moon and wins, you know, it's basically as he wins one of the games, he takes a little portion of the moon's light and then stockpiles enough light by winning enough games so that he can create five full days, which are then added into the calendar, moving their calendar from, you know, a 360-day year to a 365-day year. Now, what's going on in the story at that point is essentially an etiological uh, myth. You're dealing with an explanation of something, and if you don't know anything about Egyptian astronomy, the Egyptians were able to come up with a much more effective calendar when compared to the surrounding cultures. Most of the cultures in the ancient world used a lunar calendar, including the Babylonians and the Hebrews. And that lunar calendar usually had fewer than 165 days. Almost all of them do. It varies from culture to culture, whether it's you know 354 to 360 or somewhere thereabouts. The problem with a lunar calendar, of course, is that if it's geared, and the original purpose of the calendar is for figuring out when it's time to plant and harvest, when your year begins, as the Babylonian did, with the beginning of the planting season, you have, you know, a year go by, and if you're having a lunar calendar, it's going to end just shy of when the actual beginning of the year should be. And if you do that enough times, eventually the beginning of the year, that New Year's point, moves back further and further until it falls into the winter time, and everything's off, and that could be, you know, really life-threatening for people trying to manage their crops. The Egyptians, however, came up with a 365-day calendar. Um, now, it's not exactly accurate because it actually should have 365 and a quarter days, which is why today we have this idea of the leap year, right? Every four years we have to add a day to bring things back into balance. But if you had a lunar calendar, every once in a while you'd have to add in maybe a whole month or a collection of days to balance it back out. So the story is accounting for how that happens. Here he is playing games with the moon. And of course, you're moving from lunar to solar. And it's a great myth to explain that. And it it's, you know, makes sense. Now, the way the calendar was arranged for the Egyptians was you've got 12 months of 30 days. And at the end or beginning, wherever you want to put that, you've got five special holy days that are placed outside of any of the months of the year. Hence the loophole and the curse. She can't give birth in any day of any month of the year. But here's five new days that happen to be outside of the months of the year. And those were sacred days in ancient Egypt. Okay, And those would be the days that Nut is able to finally give birth to the five children. Basically one on each of the five days is the idea. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I left out when I'm talking about the story of the um, lunar calendar there. Um, if I 
did leave something out, I'll try to throw it in later. Often I, there's a bunch of stuff that I want to say, and um, I just blank out every once in a while. So anyways, okay, now that you've got the birth of the children, I want to pay attention to who the five children are because there's only four of them listed on your screen. You've got Osiris, Set, Isis, and Horus. The one that I left out was Nephthys. Now, on the screen, this is another thing, I should have made this even more clear. Um, when I'm putting the name Horus on the screen and saying he's an important character, I'm talking about Horus that it Plutarch refers to as Horus the Younger, to distinguish him from Horus the Elder. So in the story in your text, the five children are Hor Osiris, Set, Nephthys, Isis, and Horus the Elder. Horus the Younger comes in a little bit later. Now, Horus the Elder is not going to be a big player in the story. Um, I've always speculated, and I could be wrong, that um, it's possible that Plutarch includes a Horus the Elder and a Horus the Younger as a way to make sense out of the fact that you have various versions of these stories circulating in Egypt, and where one place may talk about Horus being a brother to Osiris and Set, uh, another story talks about Horus being the child of Osiris and Isis. So, you know, perhaps those are just divergent versions. Maybe there were two different Horuses. Um, but again, I think Plutarch does want to harmonize these things. So he's going to make it very clear that there are two Horuses. And then we're going to focus on the, the younger one a little bit later. The one that's interesting as far as the birth story goes is Set. Now, Set is going to be the trickster in the story. And even when it comes to his birth, he is going to break the rules. He's going to push the boundaries. He's going to set his own manner of birth. He doesn't come out the natural way. He comes out through his mother's side, and he comes out by cutting his own way into the world. All right? So he is a, it's a figure that represents chaos and darkness. He represents the, the, the deserts. Um, dangerous character. And he really does emerge into this story much the way the serpent does in the story of the Garden of Eden as a, a character that represents evil. Now, let's talk about the trickster set and exactly what happens. Osiris, the premier child of that group, is going to be the first pharaoh. And Osiris is a good pharaoh. He is a pharaoh that the people love. He is a god. And by the way, if you don't know, the Egyptian pharaohs were not only kings of Egypt, they were gods among men. And it starts with Osiris. He is a god. He is a man. He is a king. And he's a cultural hero, which is kind of interesting. He brings the knowledge of farming to Egypt, right? He civilizes the Egyptians, right? He brings benefits to the people. This is very different than Marduk who created man to be a slave to the gods. The Egyptians had a totally different world. The Osiris here is actually helping man. There's uh, almost an intimate relationship. And people love him. And that affection of the people for Osiris is what brings about the jealousy in Set. So here's that motivation of jealousy. Set wants what his brother has, and he wants to eliminate his brother. And he goes about it um, really the wrong way. He decides he's going to assassinate his brother, and he has this elaborate plan where he goes into his brother's chambers while he's sleeping, and he measures Osiris as he sleeps to find out exactly the proportions of his body, and then he has a box built. And this box is absolutely gorgeous. It's the best craftsmanship you've ever seen. It is you know, inlaid with all kinds of jewels and painted, and it's highly decorative, and it's brought out during this wonderful party that's being held um, and then Set offers it to whoever can fit inside the box just right. And everybody at the party goes and tries to get inside the box. And of course, if you're a little too long, you don't fit. If you're too short, you may actually fit inside, but you don't actually count as fitting because you have to fit perfectly, so nobody fits. All right. Long story short, Osiris takes his turn. And Osiris fits perfectly. Of course, it's made to his proportions. Why wouldn't he? But as soon as he lays down in the box, Set and his henchmen throw the lid on the box, nail it shut, seal it with lead, and then he takes the coffin, which is exactly what you should be picturing by this point, and dumps it into the Nile River. Now you've all seen, hopefully, a picture of an Ar uh, Egyptian sarcophagus, right? You've got the human features and form uh, sculpted right into the box itself. Now, if you know anything about the afterlife, 
uh, the journey to the duat that the deceased goes through. You can journey into the afterlife by boat, as is often the case with the early pharaohs. You know, the you know the burials around the tombs at the Great Pyramid included these boats that were designed to be the the passageway or the transportation vehicle for the pharaoh into the afterlife. Um, the average person, of course, doesn't have a boat that they're buried in, but they would have a coffin. The wooden coffin would be a symbolic um, replacement for the boat. So here in this story, it's very clear. That coffin is being put into the water, and it's going to sail down the Nile much like a boat. And off Osiris goes into the afterlife. He is now deceased. The pharaoh has been removed, and in its place, the trickster has assumed control. Right? The trickster has overthrown the father figure. And Osiris didn't see it coming. He is completely gullible and naive to even get into the box in the first place, right? Any audience in the ancient world, especially in Egypt, hearing this story, you know, you're already, like I said, picturing what he's getting into, but he's too blind to see it. So here's the idea of the father archetype, the father figure who might be a good king and not a tyrant, but he's blind, right? He's naive. He's easily deceived. Maybe his time is up. Maybe he... You know, deserved what he got. You could be the judge of that. Anyways, if I haven't showed you the visuals of some of these, you see Osiris um, on the side on the left. He's always depicted either as blue or green skinned, wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, um, and basically a mummified figure. Also a pharaoh carrying with him the flail and the crook, which represent you know him as shepherd of his people and him as the administrator of uh, punishment. Up in the uh, left. So, I'm sorry, the right side is the goddess Isis with the cow horns and the sun. And then below that, you've got a depiction of Set, who is a very bizarre um, character. We don't exactly know what kind of animal he is supposed to be. But again, he represents chaos, so he doesn't have to be anything in particular. right? Chaos doesn't really have a known form. Now, here you have the sarcophagus, the box that Osiris gets into. Um, and I'm sure that's what you were all picturing. I probably should have brought that up as I was telling the story. And then off he goes down the Nile. Now, where he lands is interesting as well. Because when you read the text, it says he gets kind of caught up in the reeds in the delta. And then he ends up at Byblos. And you might think, if you don't know the geography of the ancient world, that that was somewhere in the delta region of lower Egypt. But in fact, Byblos is a Phoenician city on the coast of of the Levant, and that was a long-standing trade partner with ancient Egypt. Byblos in Egypt had all kinds of um, trade going way, way back in time. Now, once the sarcophagus comes to Byblos, it ends up being washed ashore and ends up growing up inside a tree, which is then subsequently cut down, brought into the palace of the king and queen of Byblos, and that tree is built as a pillar or a column in the palace. Now, <clears throat> Isis is the one we need to focus on. This is the preeminent goddess in ancient Egypt. By the time Plutarch is writing, Isis was the supreme goddess of all Egypt. She had swallowed up by the Greco-Roman era almost all the roles of all the other major goddesses of older Egypt. Um, and she is very clearly the epitome of the devoted and loving wife and partner. She is going to be the one who searches. She's going to go on a quest for her deceased husband. And she will not rest until she has him back. She's the daughter of Thoth, so she is also going to be someone who's skilled in magic. And her hopes are to bring her husband back to life. And as she travels the world searching for him, she finally tracks him down in Byblos. And the story is that in Byblos, she goes in disguise and shows up as this woman to the court of the king and queen, King Melkarthus and Queen Astarte. And they fall in love with this young woman and decide to make her the nurse for their infant child. She falls in love with the family, and she decides to take care of this child. And as a gift to the couple, she decides to give this baby the gift of immortality. And the process by which the immortality would be given to the child would be by roasting the baby in the fire at nighttime while the parents are absolutely unaware this is going on. Now, if you've heard something like this before, it might be because you've read a very similar story or a similar scene in a story from Greek mythology. It's the story of... Demeter and Persephone. 
Uh, I don't believe we're covering that story this semester in the class, but it is one of the greatest of the Greek myths. I highly recommend it. But in this story, which is clearly a parallel, you have the, much like the Greek story, the parents wake up, interrupt the ritual, robbing the child of immortality. Now, Isis, unfortunately, has to let them know what she was attempting to do and also gives them the bad news that because of their interruption, the child was not going to become immortal. And then she goes ahead and says, by the way, my husband is in the pillar in the corner. Would you mind cutting that out and letting me take him back to Egypt, which they do? Okay, so she ends up getting her husband back. But it's this weird little side story in the midst of the greater narrative. Now, what's she doing in Byblos? What's the whole significance of the fire and the baby? Um, I always like to point this out when we get to this part of the story. As a matter of fact, I think your text actually cuts that part out of the story as the text is heavily edited. But it's really so fascinating. I hate going by without making a few comments about it. And the comment that I want to make is that we have in this story, I think, a preservation of a much older ritual and tradition that seems to be coming across in kind of a veiled way. Um, it's probably a mythological remembrance of ritual. And we already talked about you know myth ritual theory, how myth and ritual, by, by some accounts, were intimately connected. Now, if you know anything about the religion of the ancient uh, region of Phoenicia, this region that was once known as Canaan, the gods of Canaan actually show up in the story. The king and queen of Byblos, King Melkarthos and Queen Astarte, those are actually the names of deities that would have been worshipped by these people. God Melkarth, or Moloch, um, the MLK, um, could be pronounced a number of different ways. Um, Melek, uh, and on and on it goes. The, the word could literally mean the Lord, um, but it was generally used of a particular deity, sometimes associated with the god Baal. Um, the god Astarte, who's kind of a version of the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar, a goddess of love and fertility. Those are the two figures that you see in the story. Now, what we know about the worship of Moloch or Melkarth from Hebrew texts is that the Canaanites and the Phoenicians practiced human sacrifice of children to the god Moloch. At least that's the accusation. And of course, most people dismiss this as merely an accusation. Here are the Hebrew people writing about, you know, people that they were opposed to in a religion that they absolutely despised. Um, so of course, they're going to say all these bad things and, and characterize these things in such a negative way. Now, the interesting thing is uh, we have a little bit of information about Phoenician culture from other writers in the ancient world, particularly the Romans. And the Romans had their own interaction with the Phoenicians, particularly the Phoenicians in North Africa, directly south of Sicily at a place known as Carthage. Now, if you know anything about ancient Roman history, and we're going to do some Roman myth later this semester, you're going to know that the Romans had a series of wars with the city of Carthage known as the Punic Wars in the middle of the Republic. And the... Carthaginians were also accused by the Romans of human sacrifice, child sacrifice to their god, um, which they referred to as Jupiter, but it's basically the um, Latinized version of, again, Baal or Mel Melkarth. Now, the same thing, you know, scholars basically dismissed what the Romans had to say. They're merely characterizing their arch enemies um, in, in, a, in a particularly negative way. So generally they would dismiss the accounts of the Hebrews and the Romans as trustworthy. Now, modern archaeology has come along and discovered some things that caused some scholars to reconsider. Now, this is still up for debate among some scholars how you interpret this, but when you get to certain grave sites that have been excavated, particularly around the areas of Carthage and certain places in Sicily where Carthage had colonies, you find the Carthaginian Tophet, or um, grave site. And in these cemeteries, you find these mass burials uh, a cremation jars filled with the remains of children. Um, from my understanding, the vast majority of the children in these is, in these urns were male um, by tests that have been done, usually within a particular age range. But again, a lot of this has been speculated as to maybe the uh, child, you know, child mortality. Everybody knows in the ancient world was incredibly high. Was this just you know due to the high you know infant mortality rate, or is this something more going on here? 
Uh, a number of scholars do seem to agree that this is evidence of actual human sacrifice. So here's how you might want to understand the story of um, Isis here at Byblos. What she's doing in the story is burning the child in a fire in order to give it a gift of immortality. That might very well be some vague memory of a practice where children were offered to the god Moloch. And if you think about the practice, you know, one of the functions of myth was kind of this pedagogical function, which we talked about was uh, guiding you through different traces and transitions and phases of life as you mature and develop. Um, And even the psychological function, I guess you could say, that the story is, in a sense, capturing the type of mentality you would have to have if you're going to undergo this type of sacrifice in reality. If you're offering a child to the god, first of all, infant mortality, again, being high, the idea that you would take a child who is at the moment healthy and sacrifice it to a god, um, kind of throwing away a perfectly good human life, um, as disturbing as that is, and the idea of you know doing that to one's own child, there has to be some incredibly powerful motive for doing that, some incredible benefit that you expect to get from taking what is essentially the ultimate sacrifice. And the attitude you would have to have to justify or at least tolerate such you know, personal behaviors, possibly the idea that you are giving that child over to a god and maybe that child is going to be taken care of by that god and giving some kind of afterlife or immortality uh, that's better maybe than this life now. You know, with that kind of uh, worldview, perhaps you could justify doing that kind of action. But, you know, here we see this interesting scene in the story, which maybe uh, makes sense a little bit of what's going on here and seems to be clearly, at least to me, uh, a remembrance of these types of things. Okay. So I'd actually add that to the um, Hebrew and Roman accounts, um, this Egyptian account. Anyways, moving on with the story. What happens with Osiris? Uh, Isis gets him back. She revives him temporarily, enough to sleep with him and conceive a child, and this child is going to be Horus. Now, Osiris never really fully comes back from the dead. He falls back to sleep, and Isis hides the body, hoping that Set is not going to find him again. Of course, Set does. He's crafty. He finds the corpse of Osiris, and this time he's going to do him in. Finally, he's going to rip his body limb from limb and scatter the parts throughout Egypt and beyond. And I forget how many pieces there are, something like 13 pieces of the body. I've heard different numbers in different accounts. Scattered throughout Egypt. And Isis, being the devoted wife, continues to go back out and search for her husband, and she's going to track down every single piece. I know your textbook says she finds every piece, puts him back together, and revives him one final time with the assistance of some others. But the actual story, she does not find all the pieces. There's one piece that she fails to find, and that happens to be the genitalia. He is missing the phallus. What happens to that piece? It was thrown into the Nile, and it was devoured by fish. So it's basically gone for good. Now, This is an interesting motif in mythology. It's basically a castration scene. If you read the creation story of the ancient Greeks, you're going to see something very similar with the castration of um, Uranos by the god Kronos. Uh, The castration motif basically represents the removal of life, right? It's symbolic of a death. It's definitely a removal of one's uh, virility, right? The word uh, we think of virile, uh, masculine. It literally means man in Latin, the word weir. Um, so it's, it's really cutting one off from the thing that symbolizes life itself. And not only do you have it in the creation story of the, the Greeks, you have it in the story of creation by the Hittites, um, the god Kumarbi, biting off the, uh, the phallus of the god Anu, um, uh, uh, you know, another, uh, version of that. So here you've got this with Osiris. So in a way, you can understand why Osiris never comes back fully to the land of the living. There, he's kind of cut off permanently from that which is fertile, that source of life. Uh, and that interesting thing is where it ends up. It ends up in the Nile, right? For the Egyptians, the Nile is the source of life. The, Egypt, the Nile is the thing that brings forth life and, and, and 
prosperity and fruit and vegetation and all that kind of stuff that allows people to be able to survive in Egypt. So it's appropriate where it ends up. And of course, now Osiris is forever cut off and he's going to become the god of the underworld, right? He's going to rule and be the judge ultimately of the dead. Now, Horus also has to be preserved. Um, she hides the child, Set does find him and some scorpions sting him and kill him. But again, his mother is a goddess of resurrection and she brings Horus back and then hides him away. And when he is old enough, he is given the ultimate test from his father. Basically, it's a question and answer quiz to see if he's ready to fight Set and reclaim the throne of Osiris. And the question that he poses him is kind of silly. If you think about it at one level, he asks Horus, what would you take into battle with you, uh, a lion or a horse, which would be the preferable companion in battle? And Horus says, I would take a, a horse into battle. And if you read the text, uh, it, it's interesting the reason he gives for it. But and the reason he gives, by the way, is to pursue the enemy that he defeats, uh, to pursue a fleeing enemy, which, of course, the horse is very useful for. Now, I want you to think about it for a second from a different point of view. It seems like a silly question to ask to see if somebody's ready to you know, reclaim the throne, if he's mature. But if you ask that very same question to a little child, nine times out of ten, I would bet that the little child would say, I'd rather have a lion with me in battle. right? Because a lion's obviously much scarier and more ferocious than a horse, at least from their perspective. But of course, it's the child's answer. right? It's not the mature answer. You know, The horse very often bred for war. Uh, it's, it's an animal that's controllable, but it's also the reason he puts forth that shows his maturity. And it's that he is going to use it to pursue a fleeing enemy, which in a sense indicates Horus already has the battle won, at least in his mind. He's not trying to figure out if he, if he will beat him. He's seeing him as defeating his enemy and then kind of wiping up afterward. So yeah, Osiris says, you're ready. And then on he goes to battle set. And this is your climactic scene, right? This is the Marduk versus Tiamat scene all over again. You know, order versus chaos, Horus versus set. And Horus wins. And there are different versions of the story, how long the battle lasts, whether it's three days, three years. Horus is wounded incredibly badly. One of his eyes is almost completely damaged in the conflict with Horus. Um, I'm sorry, with set. One of his eyes, the, the, the wounded eye, represents the moon, and the good eye represents the sun. Uh, and, you know, there are different things that happen. But ultimately, at the end of the story, Horus is victorious and has the opportunity to dispatch Set to kill him. And in walks Isis to save the day. She saves Set from destruction. She stops her son, kind of puts a spell on him and, and freezes him. And Set is able to escape. When Horus comes to, he is so angry with his mother that he decapitates her, and it takes the god Thoth at the end to replace her head with that of a cow, which is probably there just to explain why there are depictions of Isis wearing a cow's head, kind of this ther theriomorphism that we see in Egyptian art. It would have been very foreign to a writer like Plutarch, who comes from a Greek tradition where the gods basically look like everybody else. In Egypt, they had this characteristic of, you know, the, the falcon head for Horus, um, the ibis head for Thoth, the, um, what did I just say? The cow head for Isis, okay? So possibly dare just uh, explain things for a Greek audience. And the other thing that's interesting is to ask yourself, why does Set get to live? Um, the text tells you that Isis has compassion on him, and she is a goddess known for her compassion. Matter of fact, it's such a positive trait and a detractive trait one of the reasons that Isis becomes kind of the international sensation in the Hellenistic period. Um, you know, there's a particular mystery cult dedicated to her that was really popular throughout Greece and Rome and around the Mediterranean. But I don't think it's the compassion that is the real reason that Set has to live at the end of the story. If Set emerges in the story as really a god of chaos, disorder, and ultimately evil, it's almost like there needs to be an explanation for that aspect of reality, that there is evil that exists, that there is chaos that displaces order every once in a while. You need to account for that and set as a good accounting. So almost of necessity, set needs to survive in the story. Um, I guess you have a happy ending. It's really hard to say, but as we kind of unpack it, the archetypal motifs very clearly, you have a hero and villain story again. 
Chorus being the hero, Set being the trickster who merges into the villain. You also have the quest, right? This is another very big part of the hero genre. Here you have Isis, who's the one who goes on a quest um, for the thing of most value, and to her, that was her husband. And you also have the descent into the underworld, which is really this whole idea of where Osiris goes and the idea that you know Isis has the potential to bring him back, um, return him to the land of the living, if not only temporarily. But the descent into the underworld is going to be a really, really important aspect of the hero stories that I want to spend a lot of time looking at later on. But speaking of the descent to the underworld and the judgment of the dead, I want to talk a little bit about the Egyptian judgment of the dead, and I think this is where we're kind of going to wrap things up. Um, what I've got on the screen is a, um, a, a portion of the Book of the Dead. It's spell 125. It's a papyrus scroll. Uh, I believe this is the scroll from um, the um, papyrus of Hunefer. And it's interesting how it's laid out almost like a comic book. And you could think of it in panels as you see the deceased. And I'm not going to go into the whole complicated aspect of how uh, the Egyptians viewed the human being and what parts need to be preserved for an afterlife. Um, but there is a test in the afterlife. There is a judgment in the afterlife. And if you want to know a little bit more about this, I guess you can watch my um, humanities, uh, ancient medieval humanities class lecture on ancient Egypt where I do discuss it a little bit more in depth. But here you have the god Anubis, the jackal-headed god, who is the um, one who leads the soul into the duat, up to the judgment scene. And here he is bringing the deceased up to the scales. And then you see him kind of in the next section where he is weighing on the scale the heart of the deceased on the left. And on the right, you see a feather, which represents mot or balance and order and harmony and goodness and all the things that you need to live according to to pass the judgment. So if your heart is light as the feather, you pass on. If your heart is heavy, hard, and the uh, tail uh, scales tip in the other direction, then you don't get punished, you get annihilated. And the beast at the bottom of the scales there is Amit, which is a combination of the most ferocious animals in Egypt, which have been the crocodile, the lion, and the hippopotamus. And uh, in spite of what most people think, the most dangerous of the three, the one responsible for more deaths than any others, happen to be the hippopotamus. Uh, I don't know if anybody was aware of that. But anyways, that's kind of off the topic. Um, right next to that, you have the picture of Thoth, who is recording the proceedings. And then after that, Horus leading the deceased up to the throne of his father, Osiris, who sits in judgment at the end. And if the individual has passed the judgment, they're going to go on to the field of reeds, the, the, the paradise for the deceased in the afterlife. And again, behind Osiris, you see his sisters, Nephthys and Isis, um, who, who take that position. So that's the story of Osiris, Isis, Horus. It is um, a wonderful story. Uh, I think it's a better narrative probably than you get out of the story of the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish is fascinating and it's got a lot of interesting things happening. But just from a narrative point of view, the story doesn't work as well as far as I've seen with a, a modern audience. Uh, my students almost unifer universally enjoy the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, whereas they tolerate, um, in a sense, the story of, um, what's it called? Os uh, the Enuma Elish. So, I don't know why the screen blurred there, but that wraps up the first two um, lectures on trickster heroes. So we've done the Enuma Elish. In Genesis, in our last lecture, we've known Osiris, Isis, and Horus today. So the trickster character that you focus on is set. Next time, we're going to be moving on and dealing with the trickster story of Prometheus. And then after that, our final trickster story is going to be the character, uh, well, the story of the death of Baldur, and a character trickster hero is going to be the god Loki. So we'll begin to do uh, Ancient Greece and then the Ancient Norse and, uh, uh, shortly after that. So again, read the stories. I appreciate you guys tuning in and sticking with the lecture. So until next time, take care and goodbye.